Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Asaf Ramorowski. I am the Executive Director of the Association for Middle East Studies in Africa, and it is really my great pleasure to welcome you once again to our webinar series. Uh, this afternoon, we have the pleasure and privilege to hear from our colleague and friend, uh, Navra Safridi. Uh, he is joining us currently from Calcutta, uh, and so we appreciate him you know, staying up this late to talk to us. Um, Navras is an assistant professor of history at the President's University in Calcutta, India, where he teaches courses on history, genocide studies, interfaith relations, uh, and also, of course, uh, the history of minority countries, as well as one of the few courses on, in general in Asia on uh, Jewish history, Israel, and Zionism. Uh, his talk this afternoon is going to focus on anti-Semitic rhetoric in Urdu. Uh, and obviously, we talk a lot about the rise of anti-Semitism globally. Uh, it's also important to make the global stance of where anti-Semitism is playing out all around, uh, as far as East Asia, as Asia at large. Uh, and really, it's uh, you know, uh, Navras is an authority on this topic. I would also want to mention and highlight, of course, that Navras was one of the finalists for uh, our Bernard Lewis Prize at a late at the latest Asmir conference that took place just a few weeks ago, and uh, we are privileged to have him uh, join us this afternoon and share his research all around. So really, it's a great pleasure to have you, Navaris, and the virtual floor is going to be yours in one minute. Uh, I just want to say one more thing, uh, just a reminder, uh, Navaris will talk for about 25 minutes or so, then we'll go into Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, and feel free to ask as many questions as possible, please type in your questions uh, via the chat. Uh, and if we, we will do our best to get to all your questions this afternoon. If you don't, feel free to email us afterwards. Uh, so really with all of that, really, without, without further ado, Navris, uh, thank you again for joining us. And I know it's good night to you uh, and the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Asaf. It's such a pleasure and at once a privilege to be speaking under the auspices of ASMIA for which I'm most grateful to the organization. I shall be speaking to you about anti-Semitic rhetoric in Urdu on YouTube. It's an analysis that I have published in the form of a book chapter in a book titled Anti-Semitism on Social Media. Religious anti-Semitic rhetoric abounds in Urdu on YouTube in multiple formats, such as interviews, but also discourses, speeches, and lectures by Islamic televangelists and clerics. Many of these videos attract viewers in millions and are widely shared on social media. The significance of the Urdu language lies in the fact that it is the lingua franca of linguistically diverse South Asian Muslims, making up almost a third of the global Muslim population. South Asia is home to 21% of the global population irrespective of religion, and one third of the world's Muslim population, with Pakistan the world's fifth most populous country and the second most populous Muslim country with a total population of 212 million, and India with a total population of 1.3 billion, billion, home to the third largest Muslim population. Some of the major ideological roots of Islamist jihadist ideology of which anti-Semitism is an integral part lie in South Asia. The region is also home to some of the largest Islamist movements such as Tabligh Jamaat, the largest Sunni Muslim revivalist movement in the world. Jamaat -e Islami, a prototype of political Islam in South Asia, Darul Ulum Deoband, alleged source of ideological inspiration to the Taliban, and Nadwat al-Ulama of Lucknow. Islamic revival is a response to Western and secular trends supporting an increased influence of Islamic values on the modern world. The solution to all the ills of Islamic societies and modern society as a whole is seen in a return to Islam in its purest form. The South Asian Muslim diaspora is also numerically stronger and far more widespread than that of Muslims from any other region, giving them immense clout to influence Muslim opinion internationally. It has also been the language of South Asian Islamic discourse 
it is spoken as a first language by nearly 70 million people and as a second language by more than 100 million people, primarily in Pakistan and India. YouTube has over 265 million monthly active users in India. About 1,200 uh, channels from Indian creators have more than 1 million subscribers. About 73% of Pakistanis watch YouTube every month. YouTube is one of the top two most visited websites and the fourth most Googled search term in Pakistan. Against this backdrop, the dissemination of anti-Semitic content by clerics on YouTube among the Muslim community must be taken seriously. When accessing YouTube in India, one finds community guidelines in 41 languages, but the only South Asian language among them is Hindi. The guidelines clearly warn against hate speech without specifically mentioning anti-Semitism. However, a couple of YouTube channels, Majid Goraya with 200,000 subscribers and Learning Center with 14,500 subscribers have posted a video each explaining the YouTube community guidelines in Urdu. This shows YouTube's disregard for the large Urdu speaking community and leaves a responsibility to inform about the guidelines on the platform to the users. Furthermore, YouTube ignores the hate speech problem caused by clerics. In order to assess the amount of anti Semitic material on YouTube in Urdu, I looked for anti Semitic content using certain keywords and phrases, aware as I was of the fact that more often than not, Urdu videos on YouTube have their titles in the Roman alphabet. I looked for relevant content using the two variants of the spelling of the Urdu term for Jew or slash and Jewish, namely Yehudi, which is sometimes spelled with U and sometimes with double O. I also searched by typing the term Yehudi in the Devanagari script used by Sanskrit, Hindi and Marathi as it is not rare for Indian Muslim YouTube channels to use Devnagri for Urdu titles of their videos. I looked for videos by typing Yehudi in the Urdu alphabet as well. Additionally, I also looked for videos by typing Jew, Jewish, Urdu in the search box. I repeated the same set of keywords by replacing Jew with Zionist and then with Zionism. I also used Sahyuniyat that is Urdu for Zionism, and Sahyuni, Urdu for Zionist, in Nastaliq, that is the Persian Arabic script, Devnagri, and Roman scripts. As a result of my search, I shortlisted 120 videos from 108 YouTube channels spread over a period of 11 years, with the oldest video posted on March 31st, 2010, and the latest video posted on April 24th, 2021. I recorded the number of times each video had been liked and commented upon, and also paid attention to the comments it had attracted. Besides that, I also looked at the number of subscribers to the most notorious of the YouTube channels posting anti Semitic rhetoric, the ideological and organizational affiliations of the clerics who are featured in those videos, their personal followings, and their educational backgrounds. I did the same with secular commentators as well. I investigated the sources of the contents and how Quranic polemics against Jews are interpreted in an overly literal manner and out of context while alternative interpretations are available. <coughs> of the 108 YouTube channels whose videos were shortlisted for this study, 11 have their number of followers in millions which in descending order are detailed in the table before you. The YouTube channel Dr. Israr Ahmed official has now been terminated. I'm not sure, but the publication of the book Anti-Semitism on Social Media, to which I contributed a chapter based on this study, may have had a role to play in it. However, a new 
YouTube channel named after Dr. Israr Ahmed has emerged in its place. There are 26 clerics and commentators who figure prominently in the 120 videos analyzed for the study. 15 of them are from Pakistan, seven from India, and one from the United Kingdom. The geographical location of the remaining three was impossible to determine. Israr Ahmed has by far the largest number of videos in Urdu with anti-Semitic content posted by several channels. Israr Ahmed tended to accuse Jews of almost everything bad under the sun. However, some of the recurring themes common to the discourses by other Islamist theologians and commentators are one, Jewish antagonism toward Islam since its advent, two, the depiction of racism, jealousy, stubbornness, arrogance, treason, and deceit as traits of Jewish character, three, the acquisition of the falsification of sacred texts, and four, Jewish global conspiracy. The polemics repeatedly referred to in Israr Ahmed's YouTube videos are the following. One, allegation of the distortion slash falsification of the scriptures by Jews, it is the Harif. Two, prohibition on friendship with Jews and Christians. Three, transformation of Jews into apes as divine punishment for violation of Sabbath. Four, allegation of the murder of prophets by Jews. Five, condemnation of most Jews for both rejecting the prophet Muhammad and failing to live up to their own religious imperatives. Six, prophecy of the annihilation of most of the Jewish people by Jew. Prophecy of the annihilation of most of the Jewish people by Jesus at the end of times as God's wrath for their misdeeds. Seven, the prophecy of the killing of Dajjal or Antichrist, followed by the annihilation of his Jewish followers, according to certain interpretations of a hadith, Sayyid Bukhari. In one of his discourses available on YouTube, Ahmed said, Talmud ki ye talim hai ki asl mein insaan to bas hum yahudi hai. Ye baqi jitre insaan hai, vayams, aur in ke liye dousra lafz hai gentiles, ye asl mein insaan numa hewan hai, aur jab ki insaan ka haq hai, hewan ko istamal karna, exploit karna, ghole ko tange pe, baghi pe baante hai ki nahi, aur bail ko aap apne hal mein jyotte hai, isi tarah humara haq hai, तमाम इंसानों का खून चूसना उन्हें एक्सप्लॉयट करना उन्हें इस्तेमाल करना और इसके लिए बेहतरीन तरीका यह है कि उन्हें वाकईतन हैवान बना दिया जाए इंसानी अक्दार उनसे छीन लिए जाएं अहमद सेज दैट अकॉर्डिंग टू द ज्यूइश टेक्स्ट तालमुद ऑल जेंटाइल्स और गोइम आर ह्यूमन लाइक क्रिएचर्स बट नॉट ह्यूमन जस्ट एज ह्यूमन बीइंग्स आर एंटाइटल्ड टू यूज अदर क्रिएचर्स सच एज हॉर्सेस एंड ऑक्सन Similarly, the Jews are entitled to use the non-Jews for their benefit, and the best way to do so is to turn them into beasts by striking at the very roots of family values. Ahmed finds the Jews successful in doing so, as according to him, the sense of modesty has vanished in the West. Ahmed tells his audience that Jews believe that sexual pleasure can be arrived at by any way whatsoever. Jews, using the power of the sole supreme power on earth, are laying siege on Muslim society so that their social and ethical order gets ruined, the way they destroyed it in the West. The video posted on April 3rd, 2020, had attracted 5,622 views, 252 likes, and 36 comments, all positive by October 14, 2022. There were no dislikes. The majority of the comments under Israr Ahmed's videos on YouTube attract praise of its content and for the speaker, but also prayers and wishes for the destruction slash annihilation of Jews slash Israel. Critique of anti-Semitic content is generally absent. However, there, are all, there always are some dislikes, though only a fraction of the number of likes such videos attract. Dislike and comment are the only means of expressing disagreement with the content of any video on YouTube. In fact, 
a comment critical of the video content can be effectively worried by YouTube's comment system if disliked by enough of the video uploaders, followers, and fans. As a result of this, a cursory look over the comment section of a video gives the impression of consensus among viewers and therefore may function like an echo chamber for anti-Semitic content. It is difficult to establish a direct causal link between the anti-Semitism in these YouTube videos and the attacks on Jews. There has been little research on the role played by Islamist anti-Semitic content on YouTube in the process of radicalization. In other words, we know fairly little as to what is the contribution of Islamist anti-Semitic content on social media in turning a person into a supporter of terrorism or forms of extremism leading to terrorism. However, Bijola and Menor find that the spread of anti-Semitic content online affects European societies at large as anti-Semitism drives social tensions, harms social cohesion, and often translates into an increase in violence. It must be noted that some of the most brutal anti-Semitic attacks in recent history have taken place in South Asia, such as the attack on the Chabad Lubavitch Center in Mumbai in 2008, a bomb explosion at the German bakery in Pune, frequented by Israeli tourists and very close to the Lal Deval synagogue there in 2010, a failed attempt to assassinate an Israeli diplomat in Delhi in 2012, among a number of foiled Islamist attacks on Jews and their institutions in South Asia. There were anti-Semitic attacks in South Asia even before the invention of the internet and the advent of YouTube. Thus, anti-Semitism was already there, but YouTube has been accelerating its spread like a virus. The importance of discourses by Islamic clerics on YouTube becomes clear when we take into account how person-to-person -person transmission has always been at the heart of the transmission of Islamic knowledge, as pointed out by Francis Robinson. The belief that listening to the author himself was the best way of getting to the, to the truth led Muslim scholars to travel long distances across the Muslim world in order to receive in person the reliable transmission of knowledge. When a scholar could not get knowledge from an author in person, he strove to get it from a scholar whose isnad or chain of transmission from the original author was thought to be the most reliable, informs Robinson. It also explains the Muslim skepticism of the written word. Robinson draws attention to the fact that print could establish itself in the Muslim world only four centuries after it had established itself in the West. He points out that the Quran was always transmitted orally. Muhammad conveyed to his followers orally the messages he is believed to have received from God, which within just a few years of his death were, were written down, but only as an aid to memory and oral transmission. And this has been the function of the written Quran ever since. With the proliferation of Islamic clerics and Islamist orators on YouTube, we are witnessing a kind of revival of the age-old tradition of the oral transmission of Islamic knowledge, but unfortunately also the dissemination of anti-Semitic discourses on a large scale. One reason behind the popularity of YouTube is that it is not only a social networking site, but also a content provider, allowing every user, both identified and anonymous, to not just view, but also upload videos. According to a 2016 representative study, 40% of users aged between 14 and 19 had encountered extremist content via video platforms such as YouTube. A report prepared by the online Hate Prevention Institute, Melbourne, found YouTube harboring most anti-Semitism, with 41% of all anti-Semitic content available on social media as per the study's sample of 2,057 categorized items. The report also points out 
that YouTube was likely to remove on average of only 8% of the anti-Semitic items from its platform that are brought to its attention, while the removal rate for Facebook is 37% and for Twitter, 22%. Of the three social media I studied for this report, Holocaust denial was found to be most prevalent on YouTube. Facebook and Twitter were discovered to be working as vehicles for the circulation of YouTube videos denying the Holocaust. YouTube promotes negative stereotypes of Jews via its anti-Semitic content in Urdu in South Asia and also in the rest of the world through the Urdu-speaking South Asian Muslim diaspora, who have a substantial presence in the United Kingdom and other English-speaking countries. Like in any other language, YouTube must translate its user guidelines to Urdu. It could also help to provide information about Jews, the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism in countries where Jews are mostly absent. Most importantly, YouTube must be pressured to remove anti-Semitic content from its platform and to ensure that it does not reappear. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Nagras. Uh, it was very, very in depth and and uh, and obviously uh, very uh, critical of the situation that we're facing. Um, we're going to open up to uh, the floor to questions now. Uh, before we start, uh, I guess we, before we go on to the audience, Alex, do you want to start us off with a question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks very much for um, a very interesting presentation about a world that. Um, many of us don't know enough about and should know more about. Uh, I guess my question is, um, has to do with Indian laws regarding hate speech. We know that the, that the European Union has been very critical of social media platforms, including Facebook and, and YouTube and, and especially Twitter lately. Um, about regulating content and uh, <clears throat> from the sound of it India doesn't doesn't do much regulation but I'm, I'm wondering whether there are uh, laws that are on the books or have been proposed uh, regarding regulation of social media platforms and and content I I must add thank you for your question but before I answer your question I must start with this disclaimer that I lack the legal knowledge to be able to satisfactorily answer this question. What I do know is that there are laws that are aimed at restricting people from indulging in hate speech, inflammatory speech, and instigating people and provoking people to, to, to resort to violence. Now, as far as the regulation of social media is concerned. To the best of my knowledge, there aren't any, any laws pertaining specifically to that. But this is something that is on the table. It's being discussed and it's highly likely that soon there will be legislation in that direction as well. But there are there are fears that have been expressed by civil society organizations that such laws would only be abused by the state for censorship and to silence uh, its critics. So this is a fear that has also been expressed. As far as anti-Semitic rhetoric is concerned, this largely goes completely unnoticed in India. And uh, it's not something that is confined only to Islamists. The people from other sections of society too have indulged in anti-Semitic rhetoric for political dividends. What is surprising is that they have done so in spite of this numerical insignificance of the Jewish people in India. In a country whose population exceeds 1.3 billion, the Jewish presence is little more than 5,000. 
So the, the Jews are so few in India that they kind of get lost in this vast sea of humanity that India is. And it also means that most of the Indians never ever come into any direct contact with Jews. Those Indians who follow Abrahamic religions, they happen to know Jews through their religious scriptures. That is the case with Christian Indians and Muslim Indians. As far as the non-Abrahamic uh, 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 Indians are concerned, that is those who are followers of Hinduism or any of the other Indic religions, they know Jews through whatever little they are taught uh, in uh, about European history, Middle Eastern history, and whatever they get to know from the press, which isn't always very reliable. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Alex, a follow-up or you're, you're good? Uh, <clears throat> I have more questions, but let's, let's take some from the audience if we All can. Right. All right, no worries. Uh, Suzanne, do you wanna go to the audience, please? Yes, okay. So the first question we have here is from Arthur Lieberman. And he writes, have you noticed, have you noted a difference in the vitriol or quantity of anti-Semitic comments in YouTubes between Shiites and Sunni communities? I have to admit that I haven't looked at it from this, this angle. But what I do know is that when it comes to anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism emerges as a, a unifying factor for Shias and Muslims. They they, this is one of the few things that they completely agree upon. There aren't, there, hard, there hardly are any differences between Shias and Sunnis when it comes to antagonism for the state of Israel, for Zionists, and in some cases, even the traditional anti Semitism or the which emanates out of overly literal interpretations of the scriptural polemics. Basim Tibi, who is a German scholar of Syrian origin, he has drawn attention to the fact how after the rise of Zionism, in response to that, there was an import of uh, features of traditional age old European classical Judeophobia to the Middle East and in the process how that classical European Judeophobia came to be Islamized in the Muslim world, in the Arab world. Great. Um, let me ask a question, Norvis. Uh, I mean, so as far as, um, I guess, twofold, I mean, on the diplomatic front, you know, is what's going on regionally wise. First of all, there are uh, obviously, we know that there are Urdu communities, uh, Urdu speaking communities uh, in the Gulf, especially, uh, you know, in the area of, of the UAE and Dubai and whatnot. Are there regional impacts as far as the, the recent Abraham Accord, the normalization with Israel? Does that have any trickle down effect on, uh, on, you know, on the knowledge, you know, you know, as far as dealing with Israel at large? And, you know, in addition, you know, part two of that question. Obviously, we know that India and Israel have been signing strategic agreements militarily wise. Modi has been, the prime minister has been to Israel, has met uh, with then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We can assume that now uh, with, the, with the recent elections in Israel, that there will be a renewal uh, of those kind of conversations. Does that have any impact at large, given the vast society uh, and, and the demographics in India, uh, as far as cracking down on the on the Islamist narrative. Okay. Well, there is a clear difference of how the response has been to Abraham Accords in South Asia. The, the Pakistanis have responded to it in a way very different to how the Muslims in uh, India have responded to it. As far as Pakistanis are concerned, it has triggered uh, a debate in Pakistani society. If Pakistan should still continue to follow the, sa the same policy of 
not recognizing the state of Israel and not having any diplomatic ties with Israel, even after several Arab countries have gone ahead in establishing relations with the state of Israel. And uh, is, uh, is it not detrimental to Pakistan's interests when India has established relations with Israel and for the, the past two decades, it has been benefiting immensely from those relations with the state by purchasing arms and getting technological support from the state. So this is something that is detrimental to Pakistan's interests and Pakistan should also think of establishing relations with the state of Israel. This is one point of view. The other point of view is that the fact that certain Arab countries have established relations with the state of Israel is not something that Pakistan should emulate because in any case, the, the establishment of diplomatic relations by these Arab states with the state of Israel is not representative of the desires of the nations that these states represent. The general public, is still very antagonistic towards the state of Israel. It's only the corrupt Arab regimes that are doing so for their own personal benefits. This is the, the perception that's largely held by people who are not inclined uh, in favor, who are not in favor of the establishment of diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. And this is a view also held by a large section of Muslims in India. They, they know that the state, at least since 2014, when the, BJ, the Hindu nationalist BJP uh, came to form government at the union, they think that the state wouldn't bother much about what they think. So, they largely are indifferent to how India conducts its uh, policy towards Israel. Now, as far as the Hindu majority is concerned, and among the Hindu majority, the, particularly the Hindu nationalists, they see Israel as a partner uh, against a common enemy identified as Islamists. They feel that the Islamists cause threat, are, are a threat to both Hindu majority India and Jewish majority Israel. So they must fight this common enemy together. And this makes Israel and India natural allies in their struggle against the common enemy, the, the Islamist militancy, Islamist terrorism against uh, India and Israel. Great, thank you. Um, Alex, um, you said you had a question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I guess one of the things that we can all agree on is that anti-Semitism tends to make the world a bit smaller and that there's only a limited number of um, uh, ideas and tropes and, and rhetoric. But I, I, I'm wondering whether in your research, whether you could detect real directionality of, of where uh, these YouTube and, and other social media based uh, content, where it was going and, and the impact on consumers, uh, in particular, in diaspora, Urdu speaking communities in Europe, uh, in particular in the UK, and in other, um, more broadly in the, in the Islamic world, for example, in Pakistan and, and South, uh, Southeast Asia as well, which have uh, obviously very close connections with, uh, with India and Urdu speaking communities. Right. Uh, most of the body of scholarship that exists on Jewish-Muslim relations is focused on the Middle East. And this is in spite of the fact that Arabs, the proportion of Arabs 
in the global Muslim population is not more than 18%. One third of the global Muslim population lives in the region of South Asia. That is the region occupied by the countries that are members of this organization that we know by its acronym SARC. That is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and Maldives, these countries. Most of the major Islamist terrorist organizations have their headquarters in South Asia. The person who is considered re ideologically responsible for the proliferation of Islamist militancy and Islamist terrorism, this jihadist ideology, was a South Asian. He was born in India and then he lived the rest of his life in Pakistan. I'm talking of Maulana Abul Ala Maududi, who at once influenced Shias and Sunnis. His writings were translated into Arabic by Maulana Abul Hassan Ali Hasni Nadwi, who was one of the, who, who he was the chair of the trustees, he was one of the founding trustees of the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. And uh, his Arabic translations of Maududi's Urdu writings were later read by Sayyid Qutb. And in his writings, he found how Maududi had revived the concept of Jahiliya, a term that is used to refer to the pre-Islamic age of ignorance. And all Western influences were seen as corrupting forces. And the more Westernized a part of the world was, the more corrupt it was perceived. And it was felt that these forces were threatening Islam, and hence it was incumbent on Muslims to wage jihad or holy war against this assault on Islam and Muslim societies. So this ideology was presented to the world by Maulana Maududi, then embraced by Sayyid Khutb of Muslim Brotherhood and popularized across the world. He, he also influenced uh, Ayatollah Rula Musawi Khomeini, who brought about Islamic revolution in Iran in 1979. So we make a big error when we ignore South Asia and focus only on the Middle East when it comes to Jewish Muslim relations. As I pointed out, South Asian Muslims have a huge diaspora. They Islamic seminaries are popular across the Muslim world. Muslims youth from across the world go for, for studies to the Islamic seminaries. Now there are South Asian televangelists as well who are propagating uh, this hate ideology. All this certainly after the establishment of the state of Israel, Scriptural polemics were, all, were always there. Those scriptural polemics were always there, but those scriptural polemics were not necessarily interpreted in an overly literal manner as they are done now. Prior to the rise of Zionism, there hadn't been such an import of classical European Judeophobia and its Islamization that has taken place now, it is only because prior to the establishment of the state of Israel, Jews were not seen as a political entity. Hence, they could be tolerated. The concept of equality was never there because the, the, very, concept, the very concept of equality was seen as unfair. How could Jews or Christians be expected to be treated as equals to believers because they were del deliberately refusing to follow the right path, which was Islam. So they, 
it was necessary for the state to differentiate between Muslims and Jews and Christians. Hence, equality, far from being seen as virtuous, was seen as unfair and unjust to the believers. And now with, this, with the emergence of modern nation states and democracy, and with democracy, the concept that all citizens, irrespective of their religious persuasions, ought to be treated as equals, is seen by these Islamists as unfair. And hence, Islamists are also so vehemently opposed to the institution of democracy, which they see as completely un-Islamic. Because in their imagination, all non-Muslims ought to be treated as only protected minorities, but never as equals. So there are a number of factors that converge to fuel this, anti, this antagonism, the, this enmity towards Jews. And this is how uh, anti-Semitism anti flourishes uh, among in Muslim societies. I'm not sure if I have been successful in answering your question. No, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's very helpful. Um... Uh, oh, uh, we have another question from the audience. Does anyone want to take that before we go back to Alex? Yes. Okay. This question is from Chris, and he writes, are there links of some of these speakers to specific terror organizations regarding funding and recruitments? Uh, uh, this is something that I'm not aware of. This is uh, an area that I still have to study. I still have to research this. Great. Uh, a question that I had going back now uh, to what you were saying, taking it in a little bit of a different direction, and then uh, we'll, we'll go back to Alex. Um, the impact of, uh, of, you know, there's a lot been written and a lot been studied about the impact of Gandhi and Gandhi's views of, of Israel and, and, you know, uh, peace in the world, the, the conflict at large, can you talk about that influence today, you know, and how that impacts, you know, uh, the culture or society, you know, in the age of social media and infotainment, is that, res is that still impactful? Is that still an influencer? Or is that, you know, is it too far back to, to actually, you know, for the younger generation in particular, who live on social media, uh, are these teachings uh, not relevant or do not resonate enough? <clears throat> what we are witnessing in India is a rise in the popularity of Adolf Hitler, which is inversely proportional to the decline in Gandhi's popularity. If you go to Facebook, you will find numerous uh, profiles with uh, Hitler as the name. That is, there are a number of Indians who support Hitler as their name on, on uh, Facebook, on, so, on social media. Uh, Hitler memorabilia is immensely popular in India. There are films released with the protagonist called Hitler, though those films are not biopics or, or, or on, on Hitler. It's just that there are certain virtues that are associated with, with Hitler and anybody who is seen to possess those, those, those qualities is called Hitler. This is how these characters are depicted and this is the projection of Hitler in popular culture. And parallel to this is decline in Gandhi's popularity that have been displays of mock assassination of Gandhi Gandhi is made fun of. All these things are happening and Gandhi is, bl is unfairly blamed for the partition of India, for uh, the appeasement of the Muslim minority and all these things. But uh, coming to your question, if Gandhi has had an influence on India's policy towards Israel, I won't say he hasn't ha had an influence. He certainly has had an influence. 
but there were many other factors too. Gandhi was associated with the Indian National Congress Party and Indi Gandhi was absolutely opposed to the partition of India. He wanted to avoid India getting partitioned at any cost and hence he couldn't bring himself to agree to the partition of Palestine for the establishment of the state of Israel. So it was India's own domestic situation that influenced the Indian state to take the posture that it took when it took two years to even recognize the state of Israel after it was established. India waited for at least one Shia country and one Sunni country to first recognize the state of Israel. The first Sunni country to recognize the state of Israel was Turkey and the first Shia country to recognize the state of Israel was Iran. After these two countries had recognized the state of Israel, only after that did India recognize the state of Israel, but postponed the establishment of diplomatic relations with the state of Israel until the Madrid conference took place. So Gandhi's influence did play a role, but there were many other factors too. India had this dispute with Pakistan on, on Kashmir, and India feared that if uh, it did not, if it established relations with, with uh, Israel and did not, uh, and wasn't seen as supporting the Palestinian cause, then all Arab states and the entire Muslim world will fall in the lap of Pakistan on the issue of Kashmir. So this fear was certainly there. It, it took India four decades to realize that this policy hadn't helped. India in getting Muslim world support on the issue of Kashmir. But then the oil rich uh, Persian Gulf countries also fulfilled 70% of India's fuel requirements. So this fear was also there. If those countries refused to supply oil to India, then that could be a problem. Uh, there are a, a large number of Indians find employment in these Persian Gulf countries. So that is also a big source of revenue to the, to the country. So all these considerations were there uh, that influenced India's policy towards Israel. And of course, Gandhi's attitude also did play a role. Gandhi comes across as somebody who did not have a very realistic understanding of the situation in, in Europe because he very infamously advised the Jews to offer uh, non-violent resistance to the Nazis. He seems to have mistaken the Nazis to be the, the, the same as the British. And this is something that for which Gandhi has been made fun of. And uh, Martin Buber very famously wrote two letters to him but we, he never received any response from Gandhi. It is believed that Gandhi never received those letters. Perhaps he was traveling uh, when those letters reached his, his ashram and he never got the opportunity to read those letters or respond to Martin Buber. Okay, um, thank you. So Andrea Spindle in Toronto sends greetings to you as well as writes the following. I know that you, Navras, have wanted to see the Israel issue, Israel issue communication in Urdu, but this hadn't happened to my knowledge. Can the government of India urge this? There is a lot available in many languages, but not Urdu, which is spoken by millions around the world. I... I, uh, f first of all, I reciprocate uh, Andrea's greetings very, very warmly, and I'm glad that and grateful to her, uh, to her that she found the time to listen to my lecture. Now, as far as the production of some literature in Urdu is concerned, I think the Embassy of Israel has taken a step in this direction. They regularly release statements for the Urdu press. 
This is something that they have been doing. They also have a, a, an online magazine in, in Urdu to inform the people about the state of Israel and Jewish affairs. So this is a positive step that they have, have taken. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I think we have one last question, you know, this paying attention to the time here. Alex, do you want to ask your, your uh, last, you'll, you'll be the last uh, question for today? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to resist the temptation to ask what the appeal of Hitler is in, uh, in contemporary India, but I want to go back to, um, <clears throat> to the, the, the question of, of YouTube and, and technology. And we know, of course, that uh, Whereas 150 years ago, newspapers, this new radically new technology was important for disseminating ideas within communities and across communities and across international boundaries superseded by radio, which became particularly important in the, the Muslim world, um, which was in a sense uh, superseded by a, a covert technologies like cassettes, which were important um, in, in particular in the 1960s and 1970s for disseminating um, prohibited, prohibited messages. Um, now we have YouTube and, and uh, social media, but uh, let's bring all, this all the way up to satellite media and satellite networks. And we, we know about, uh, we in the West um, know a little bit about Al Jazeera funded by the government of Qatar and the, <coughs> the, the, the slant, the messages that it brings in, in English um, as well as other messages in, in other languages. And I was just wondering what kinds of um, international satellite communication is there in, in Urdu and other South Asian languages? And what are the messages? Messages re re regarding what? Well, regarding anti-Semitism and, and Jews. And uh, obviously Al Jazeera is extremely hostile, particularly well, in Arabic, Arabic, but less so more subtly in, in English. But what about other networks that, that we well, should be thinking about? Well, as I pointed out in my presentation, that global conspiracy theories are very common and uh, the rhetoric is more or less the same in other media too as on YouTube, as we find in the rhetoric on YouTube. It's not very different from what, what, what is there on YouTube. In fact, not, why am I even saying not very different? It's identical to what is the nature of rhetoric in, on YouTube. It's identical. As far as the Shia media, the South Asian Shia media is concerned, it is influenced by the rhetoric, the Iranian rhetoric. The, whatever rhetoric emanates out of Iran is very enthusiastically embraced by South Asian Shias. And uh, as far as the Sunnis are concerned, they are influenced by the Arabic anti-Semitic press. Whatever up, make, appears, in uh, the Arabic language, whatever anti-Semitic contents appear in the Arabic language, sooner or later make their appearance in the Sunni Urdu press in South Asia. So there is a clear link between the Middle East and South Asia in this respect. South Asian Muslims have a look at the Arabs in a spirit of deference because after all Prophet Muhammad was an Arab so they have high regard for, for, for Arabs and often try to emulate the Arabs. They often think that Arabs are perhaps the model Muslims and this is how they should also practice Islam and now this has increased even more so with the growing influence of Salafis through the funding that they provide to Islamic seminaries across the world and, and to, to mosques 
in, in, in South Asia. Great. Thank you for that, Navras. Um, so really, I, I really want to thank you again, uh, you know, for taking the time to talk to us this afternoon and really giving us insight into, uh, the, you know, into this area of the world, which, you know, people should know more about. But obviously, you know, uh, you're, you're on the ground and uh, your insights are, are extremely valuable. And obviously, we hope you can come back and talk about further research on this, uh, on this growing concerns and growing topics. Also, of course, I want to thank you again for staying up late. I know it's already almost 11 o'clock by you. So I really appreciate you uh, staying in professional mode and staying up for us. Um, so we appreciate that. It was at once a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me with you. My pleasure. And of course, I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon uh, from around, the, you know, from wherever you're located around the world. Uh, be, be on alert for uh, future webinars. Uh, those of us here in the States, uh, I really want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving holiday this weekend uh, and hope everybody is doing well. And we will talk soon. Have a good afternoon and a good night.